Unfortunately, they don't let me drink here on campus. Um, or maybe we would have started at 8 a.m. in time, and then who knows how things are going to for this, for for this <laughs> event. But, uh, but you guys feel free to get a little comfortable. But I, I want to make sure, again, please, please, please fill out that survey. Um, it, it'll just take you a minute. Uh, is it Chelsea sending out the survey? Should we come from Chelsea out. or from the drone tech event? Or drone tech email? I'm not positive on that. Okay. She, she takes care of it. Likely it's going to come from drone tech since that's what you did sign up for. So you'd see an email from NCCC drone tech. Um, please take the time and, uh, and fill that out. Um, Chris, we're going to get that survey sent out uh, just as soon as we get done here. I believe Chelsea should be monitoring this feed, so as, as soon as we, uh, we finish up, she's going to get that sent out to everybody who's here. Um, and it shouldn't be long, it just helps us with our recording. Again, this is all National Science Foundation funded, and they really care about uh, the, the, you know, Quantitative data, right? You know who we reached, how we reached them, all that kind of stuff. Um, thanks, Jeff. We, we really appreciate it. Uh, we, we we think we're awesome too. And, you know, we're, you guys are you guys are awesome. And like I said, uh, us sharing resources together um, that that's what's really going to make us all better, and that's what it's all about. Um, you know, getting our students and uh, being able to upskill them. So. Um, how many batteries do you recommend for Tello or Mambo drone? Uh, again, what we've been doing is kind of three to four. Three of these at a minimum. Yeah, so three at a minimum. Um, you know, four is a four is a good round number. Uh, it, it allows us to to charge and have that that done charging and able to cool off a little bit because charging, much like using the battery, will heat it up and we want to cool it down a little bit. So having that little bit of extra time uh, is definitely helpful. Um, so three minimum there. I promise you, you can never have too many batteries. <laughs> many as you can afford. All right. all right, and again, you guys are going to get these resources. We're going to send them all out to you, all the links, all the extra pages, the flight log books. Um, anything pretty much that we've discussed in here is, is really going to be a part of it, uh, plus the presentations. The video itself will go out. Uh, likely our, our marketing side will want to do some edits and things like that. Uh, but before sending it out or, or posting it onto the resource page. Um, if anybody has any questions about any of this stuff and you can't stay on, or even if you do stay on and, and we didn't you know, adequately answer your questions, our contact information is in the slideshow. I think I saw Tom's in there. I, I know I put mine on, on the beginning of, the, of my slideshow. Please reach out. Um, uh, again, NSF funded, we're being paid to help you guys set up these programs to help you guys bring this technology down into your classroom, and that's what we want to see. We want to really develop these pathways so students who are interested in this type of thing can go on and make a career out of it. Um, and, and frankly, we're not going to have a lot of choice coming up. Autonomous technologies are, are more and more prolific every day, and uh, it's just going to continue that way. All right. Uh, you tell us get a battery charger that charges more than one battery at a time. Awesome advice, Mike. Um, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Important. Both of them make uh, multi chargers. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Tellos and, and Mambos have yeah. multi chargers. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely take the a little extra expense and be able to charge more, uh, more batteries at a time. So. Um, thanks, Terry. Let's see. Thanks, Mike. Glad you learned a lot. Um, so at this point, maybe we'll give a few minutes because we, we did come out maybe nine minutes early. I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, just people telling us how awesome we are. My wife is going to say, I don't need a bigger head, uh, but we do appreciate it. Um, so, I, and again, please, please reach out. So we'll take a couple minutes. We'll go get our, our geospatial guy and bring him in here. Uh, you folks go, you know. Um, take a quick bathroom break. Make, make your water, your tea, or whatever other beverage you prefer. And then at 3.30 here, we'll jump right into our open forum. Any questions you have, I know I pushed off a couple of questions to the back end here because there were more specific situations. Um, I, I'd love to answer them. So uh, please stick around if you're if you're interested. Let's see, uh, Lynn, the survey is going to be emailed out. Um, so Chelsea should be doing that here any second now, I'm hoping. Um, but she, she knows that we're ending here, so um, we'll, get, we'll get those out immediately. All right, so it looks like 1250 a pop for a kit at Skills USA. So the Skills USA kit looks pretty pricey. And uh, that's, I'm assuming, for multiple drones and uh, game pieces. 
that, that's probably for, for an entire kid, yep. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it is what it is, and I, I wish we could influence their pricing, but. I think I should I turn off the stop sharing here? Let's start sharing the computer screen. You just want to stop sharing? Or? Why we lost our camera. Oh, you want camera three? No problem. All right, so there's not a ton of us in this, so I mean, as long as it doesn't get too crazy, I think we can just go ahead and uh, have folks unmute and talk. That's just crazy. And let's see, you're going to be sitting here, so maybe we're just going to switch over to camera two. And that's got the whole room there. Yep. So, Tom, you can have a seat in your area. I'll still work the, uh, the chat function. So it may not be as easy to see us now. We've got kind of a whole room view going on. Uh, but unfortunately, you still can hear us. So, let's see it. Hey, uh, this is this is Terry Ayers. I, I put a note on the uh, chat about the Mind's Eye kit. Uh, the the price is uh, $1,250, but it's only for the drone kit, the curriculum, and uh, and that's it. So uh, the uh, the the gates that they use for the competition are nothing more than PVC pipe. Uh, there is a laser module that will be placed on it, and some of the sensors that they use on the playing field. Uh, will be shot with the laser from the drone, uh, simulating a mining operation on an asteroid. So that's uh, that's that's been the competition for the last couple of years, and it would have been the same this year at Skills USA. Okay. Well, I certainly like the scenario. Um, that twelve fifty is really gonna. Well, one thing I noticed about the Pitsco site is I think they're overcharging for the basic drones. You can probably do better on your own than just going to Amazon or the actual rise. I can get the drone pieces cheaper. Okay. Than going through that. Yeah, that's that's definitely a possibility. Finding a way to, to uh, a different source for the uh, for the equipment uh, might be helpful. So, like I know with the uh, with the rad kit, it, it is specific to Mambo, and now there's only one supplier of that. Um, we're stuck. So, yeah. All right, um, so let's see. I know Doug had asked a question about iOS or iPad uh, apps used for flight logs. And again, I'm, I'm not a real uh, an Apple guy for the most part. I'm kind of an Android side, um, and that's a, an argument for a different day. Um, <laughs> not sure we think we could argue on that one for a while. Uh, but uh, at Air Data, I believe, is iOS compatible. And it's uh, it's spelled just like it sounds, Air Data, and and they have a, a nice, and I say nice because it's really easy to use if you're flying DJI equipment. Uh, it's supposed to pull the data directly from the DJI flight log, and and log that for you. Um, so that's that's a nice thing to use and a nice thing to have. Um, outside of that, uh, again, the Excel spreadsheet that we're going to send you with the log, uh, you, you still have to manually go through and fill it out. Uh, but frankly, it's a it's a very comprehensive log. And you should be able to to get a, an app uh, to run Excel on an iPad. So. Can you hear me, guys? You're kind of cutting out a little bit, there. Right? Yes, you're, you're cutting out. Oh, yeah. uh, um, let's see. I lost my right connection just as your initial meeting the uh, meeting ended, and so I'm having to switch over to my iPhone. Um, yeah, I apologize. The, the room itself was set up with a with a self recording feature too. I, I may do is just send you a. Uh, an email with a couple of questions when you have time to just send me a note back. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I don't see your name. I, I just see you as iPhone on here. Uh, can you tell yeah, me your name so I can make sure to keep an eye out for it? It's, uh, this is Doug Manifold. Doug Manifold, great. Okay. Okay. I um, was logged on on my computer and as their meeting ended, um, I was disconnected from the internet, so I've called back on my iPhone. 
Ah, uh, gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, anything that we don't get answered today, or, or if we have any issues, um, email is absolutely a way to get a hold of us. Um, and, and Doug, I've seen an email from you already, so you should have the address and everything. So. Okay. Yeah. I'll just uh, I'll use an email to connect. All right. Great. Thanks, Doug. Night, guys. Good night, sir. All right. Um, I know Julie at one point was asking some questions about some specific use cases. Uh, Julie, you wanna you wanna pipe in and play us out the scenario? Yeah. Hi. So I had uh, several questions. Um, first of all, our our district is working on making a new pathways program, and we're very very interested in adding drone pathway here. So I'm I'm, I'm really working on developing a scope and sequence starting in in elementary all the way up through um, high school. Um, and Tom Went is one of my AF um, alternative learning center pieces is on this call as well. So I'm really hoping we could get some drone. Um, st um, STEM connection to our ALC students. Um, so I, uh, I've been I've been piloting um, some some test cases in um, in coding classes in in upper elementary uh, and middle school using a combination of of dash and dot robots, um, microcontrollers, and tele drones, and I'm teaching it as kind of a role playing simulation model. Um, and so I'm, um, I piloted a search and rescue kind of after the storm and kind of had a whole gym set up with kind of a destroyed community and stranded people, injured people, um, and they had a week to teach themselves um, coding and I had learning stations set up and I just kind of st stood back and put the kids in, in, in community crisis teams and just kind of observed how they taught each other how to code to be able to win the game. And then at the end, I brought in our, our, our Washington County Sheriff, uh, our drone um, division, uh, and, and the deputy sheriffs actually are, are part of the team. So I'm looking to try to use that same kind of a simulated model and now expand, expand um, experiences for my students and, and level it up. So my next pathway here is to try to see how I could use the drones and microcontrollers in precision agriculture and sustainable agriculture. And I, I was just given five acres of, of property to try to build a classroom for next year. And part of it, I'm going to make a community giving garden. And I would love your recommendations on how we could build in the drones out there. And, and then I could deploy a whole bunch of microcontrollers with, with um, climate kit sensors. I'm wondering if you had any, any suggestions for that. As what type of drones do I need to get? I have a whole classroom set of tellos. I can't really take those outdoors from what I'm hearing. So would you go with, with a DJI minis? Would you go with a, a, Maverick, uh, a, a Mavic Pros? Or would you go right into phantoms? I'm just kind of trying to figure out if I'm doing a scope and sequence. I don't want to start the kids moving from tellos straight into a phantom. I want something in the middle. You know, you think so, but it, it sounds like with your use case, that the only thing that I've found with the uh, Mavic Pros, Mavic Pro 2s, is the, the SDK for that is not really widely adopted. So the SDK, I, I'm sure, as you may know, but I, I want to make sure everybody knows, is the software developer's kit. So DJI will release an SDK for the aircraft that they use, and third-party providers will go out and use that uh, to be able to, to program an application uh, for, for whatever use case that they're doing, uh, whether it be, you know, Lichy or Pixel Recaps or whatever it is. Um, I, I found that the, the Mavic 2s and even the Mavic Pros, they got a rolling shutter. So if you're gonna send them out on an autonomous mission uh, that, that has them capturing data, uh, specifically if you want it flown the same way each time, things like that, uh, or if you're trying to provide an ortho mosaic, so a, a, an image with a bunch of images stick, stitched together. Um, with the with the Meta 2 Pro, what you generally have to do is you have to get it to stop at every picture location or be flying very, very slow in order to get a quality picture. Uh, otherwise, you wind up with some rolling shutter distortion. Uh, maybe you'll wind up with, uh, with some blurriness in the photos. Uh, whereas the Phantom 4 Pro actually has a mechanical shutter. Uh, which means that it's not 
It's not subject to the same, the, the same rolling shutter issues. You can be moving at a faster clip and still get a quality picture. Um, so when you look at, at coverage time and flight time, well, yeah, the flight time is just a little bit better on the Navic 2 Pro, but in, in a scenario like that, because generally, again, with agriculture, we're, we're doing automated missions that we, that we pre-program into it. Um, it. It actually might be a lot better to go with that Phantom 4 Pro. Uh, as an all-around imaging and mapping aircraft, I think if you ask around, uh, you'll, you'll get the same answer that the Phantom 4 Pro is, is the way to go on that. Okay. Um, and, and frankly, the price point is right about the same. Okay. Um, so it's it's not uh, not a huge difference as, as far as you know financial investment goes. So what type of, of thermal camera, or you had mentioned a micro um, a multi spectral camera? I, yes. I, I want to be able to do some mapping of vegetation, and, and our uh, our, our um, uh, sustainable still water is a group of uh, our businesses downtown and they want to partner with students to have us fly over buildings to try to map thermal imaging and energy leakage and I want to just test this out over district buildings can I just interchange um, cameras that I can mount onto that Phantom 4 Pro and do you have any suggestions of cameras? Yeah so the problem with the Phantom 4 is that there is no uh, interchangeable cameras at this point um, and that's the same with a, with a lot of the uh, systems out there that aren't necessarily geared towards it. Uh, so for instance, like the Inspire 1 could take, you know, four or five different cameras, including a thermal camera, whereas the Inspire 2 doesn't even let you use a thermal camera. It's just focused on RGB, uh, you know, your, your basic digital images. So while you can change the camera, it's not necessarily uh, going gonna to change to the different waves. Um, one thing that you can do, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call Sentara on this one. Uh, Sentara actually has some solutions for everything down from a, a Mavic Pro uh, all the way up to Inspires and, and Phantoms. Uh, they, they, they have integration kits that are made to integrate onto them. Um, you're gonna pay a little bit more for them, but then you're paying for those additional sensors. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of two separate things there. Um, if you can find some older Inspire ones, um, they, they integrate really well. Um, you can put a, a thermal sensor on a Phantom 4. I've seen it done by a few people. Uh, there's a few organizations out there that there there's some uh, you know integrator kits uh, for it. Um, but again, in my mind, when we're doing inspections, we're we're not looking at at uh, we're looking at quantitative data. You know, we're looking at numbers and being able to provide numbers to back you up, especially when you're talking with businesses who are going to possibly uh, put out funds to, to make improvements and things like that. You know, they're, they're gonna pay some roofer to come in and redo their roof based on your information. Um, so one thing I will hesitate about is, is making sure that you put some kind of contract in place that makes it really, really clear that these are students practicing doing the best they can and that you're going to deliver the best data that they can. Uh, but I, I'd really be worried about liabilities without some kind of contract in place that spells that out. Okay. Um, um, I'm part of the Green Step Cities program. So we're just trying to provide some baseline, you know, um, 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 some data for okay. our community. So, um, I'm not sure if we should even dive into that. I was approached with this and I had seen some um, of your work online. So that's kind of what, what kind of brought me here to the space. So fantastic job on that project, by the way. It was, well, it was wonderful. Um, so I'm, um, I'm just wondering if I should really hold off on going in these directions into thermal graphics yet, um, or, or thermal imaging. Um, and, 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 and multispectral, and I should really build up my program. I'm starting in elementary, kind of build up, so, you know, so my students are getting their, you know, license and kind of working on some simulated role-playing pieces, and then later on I can start to get into more of that actual um, real-world experience. I want to go... Yeah, yeah, I, and definitely when you're working with, with elementary age kids, you know, um, you, you do want to start off with a more with a more basic system. I mean, and when I say more basic system, I'm saying not the integration of these expensive cameras. Um, for instance, the thermal camera that I use for the project you're referring to, um, 
you know, that's that's a 10K plus sensor. Um, okay. and, and while my seven-year-old is awesome, he flies my Matic, he flies my Inspire, he's flown, you know, little racing aircraft. Um, there is no way I'm putting the Matic controls with, with that sensor on it at this point. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> kids are going to be juniors and seniors in high school that are going to be working on this project, but I just, I'm hesitant to really go into that, so I just want to keep that on. One thing, one thing you need to also consider is the liability insurances when you take those out in a commercial setting. Uh, while while the, the businesses may be well, uh, well versed in all of that, you do all these things, you know, all it takes is one of those drones to crash into a windshield or an automobile on the street, and there you'll be. So you got to got to look at that as well. Good point. Yeah, making sure that your your insurance would would cover that type of thing. You know, working with your administrator to to be sure of that would would definitely be a big thing. Making sure that it covers your students and you and the aircraft okay. um, for for any liabilities. Um, but when, when we're talking about the actual sensor itself, uh, yes, I, I really would recommend a radiometric sensor. Uh, that you can actually pull temperature data from uh, for that type of analysis. If we're just looking at kind of an overview and, and we want to see that, hey, there is a temperature difference there, but not actually have to quantify it, you can get a non-radiometric sensor, uh, which would, you know, considerably step down the price, uh, sometimes by as much as, as, as half or, you know, or a quarter or so, uh, less expensive than, than the radiometric one would. Uh, but just realize that, that at that point, you are, you are just looking at comparative data. Uh, you, you can't, you know, run through something like FLIR tools and, and actually get hard numbers that you can hand to them and say, yes, you know, you've got uh, a more intense leak here than there. Um, a good practice when you are doing that, if you do end up going that route, is to make sure that your students take regular digital images as well. Okay. So, for instance, if, and if you can swing the investment, something like an N210, um, either that or a, an X-T2. So the M210 is an aircraft that allow, uh, allow you to have dual gimbals, so I can mount a, a basic RGB digital camera and a thermal camera together, and I can slate them. So when one points in one direction, it automatically centers the other one in that direction. Uh, so when you are looking at issues that you found, uh, a lot of people with no experience with thermal data have a hard time looking at it and knowing exactly what they're looking at. So being able to have the RGB image right next to it uh, really helps on the visualization uh, when, when you're talking to these folks about, about exactly what you're seeing too. It also helps other inspectors. Uh, there's plenty of roof inspectors out there who don't use thermal imaging. And, and so having the RGB image right next to the thermal image uh, gives them a little bit more uh, warm and fuzzies. So. Okay. And also if you're looking at doing precision ag, you might want to look more towards uh, Near infrared, red edge, uh, and DVI. Okay. That might be a less expensive sensor early to uh, acquire. Okay. Yeah, and on, on the X side, it's also going to depend a little bit about what you're growing. So, for instance, near IR is really great for getting the top tip lamps. So, if we start talking, you know, soybeans, short wheat, things like that, uh, we, we can image and, and get information from most of the uh, of, of the plant at that point. Uh, when you start talking things like corn that actually have a fuller canopy and they're taller, the near IR doesn't penetrate nearly as far. So that's where red edge kind of comes into play. It's got that penetration to really get down into that foliage and, and give you the best information, not just information from the tops of the plants. So again, it, it ties back into your use case uh, a little bit there. And uh, I certainly, uh, well, I want to connect with you anyway over the things we were talking about with Jeff there. Uh, but we can certainly uh, talk deeper if you've got more of an idea of what you'll be planting and things like that uh, for, for recommendations. So we can, I, I have permission to plant anything that I want. So my kids are working with the University of Minnesota um, College of Food and, and Agriculture just trying to pick out plants. And now I'm, I would like to try to figure out how we can now like move into the technology aspect. Analyze. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one thing I will say is we, we did some work with the uh, oh with the, the research farm up in Roseau County. It's a U of M extension, I believe. Yeah. Um, but so what, what they do out there is they take different varieties, and I, I believe it was wheat and rye was kind of most of the stuff that they were doing, uh, you know, rye grass, things like that. Yeah. Uh, but so what they did is they, they planted these plots in sections 
that are uh, slightly larger than this table I'm standing in front of. So, you know, maybe it's, it's, you know, five feet by 15 feet. And then what they went through and did is they changed the formula of the fertilizer and things like that that they use. So on one they do 5%, then on the next they do 10%, on the next it's 15, um, you know, and, and they change those individual variables within a row. And then when we flew overhead and took that data with the multi-spectral camera, we could clearly see, uh, you know, different things from those different little sections as far as how healthy they were. Um, and, and obviously, you know, lots of different factors go into a play, uh, you know, are they all being watered the same? Uh, so you can have a row maybe where you water them at different rates and, and be able to tell, you know, hey, this type of seed with this type of fertilizer and this watering schedule is going to give you the best results. At the end of the day, this is awesome information to get out there, not only for the students to get them the experience, uh, but I read a white paper a couple years back, and it told me that uh, in the American agriculture industry, if we can increase yield by 1% and decrease cost by 1%, that's an extra billion dollars a year in our economy. Wow. And I mean, that's, that's like huge. That. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. That helps a lot. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. And then let's see, we got uh, Patricia uh, with the with the iPad drone flight logbook. Um, again, air data or the Excel file that we're gonna send you. Uh, there are a ton of them out there. Um, you know, everybody and their mom is, is making new apps and things in their garage. Uh, so there's there's probably a ton out there that I haven't even heard of yet. Uh, I tend to, to find something that works really well and stick to it. Um, so that's what I'd recommend is, is the Excel uh, spreadsheet or the, the air data for, for iOS. Um, uh, and of course, you can either go through and make your own or, or whatever you'd like to do. So, um, let's see. Uh, Mike says, we can always just do comparative photography, which is setting up a bunch of waypoints to take still shots from and compare. Absolutely. So with your RGB camera on the edge side, you could do the comparative photography um, using something like Litchi or Pix4D. Litchi does have a $25 fee for, for each instance. Um, Pix4D Capture is free, and that's the, the flight app. Um, it, it's great, it's repeatable, it'll go to the same places every time you fly and, and take them the same way. Um, you do have to uh, keep, keep in mind some different things like cloud cover, um, and, and, and as bad as it sounds, uh, partially cloudy is our, is our worst time to, to capture data like this uh, because the different changing shadows. So full sun or full cloudy is going to be best for that type of stuff. Um, but you can go through and you can take those pictures. You can uh, run it through an AI engine. I know you were talking earlier that you were doing some stuff around AI. Uh, so as the seeds are sprouting, you can actually run it through an AI engine. You fly a little bit lower to, to really get good pictures. And you can count out you know, how many individual corn stumps, for instance, are actually sprouting for you early in the year. And then as the year progresses, you can start marking these areas. So for instance, tons of farms out here, they've got lower spots that they use for drainage. Well, I still see farmers out here when they plant the old fashioned way, planting through that area because it's easier to plant through that area than it is to stop, turn everything off, you know, go to the next area and then start again. Uh, but, but that's money in the ground that they're, they're not gonna get back. Um, so, so I mean, there's, there's tons of little things that you could do out there uh, when it comes to that, you know, contour lines and shapes. Um, you, you could start bringing in, you know, RTK and, and GPS uh, based solutions for, for ground control. And then Steve? Yeah, when they, you're talking about the old fashioned way where they just pop through it. That's, that's the wonder and benefit of precision ag is on the more modern equipment, you can actually write a prescription, computer prescription, and it'll tell the spreaders when to stop. So you go over that area and it'll say like, you know, the left boom or the right boom. Whichever one's going over that low spot, that wet spot, you can have a program in there, it'll tell it to shut off. So you're not dropping seed in that bad ground. It just shuts off as soon as it's out of that zone, boom, kicks back on again, and away you go. So that's one of the real benefits of using uh, imagery and geospatial on the planting and precision ag. Yeah, and the newer tractors, not only can you tell a left boom or right boom, but individual nozzles can be controlled. Yeah. So you can, you can actually use a UAS, fly over with a multi-spectral camera, upload that data as a shape file into the tractor, and anywhere that you tell it, it, it's not worth this time to spend the money, 
Um, it, it can turn off the individual sprayer head as it passes over that area automatically, no input from the cabin and the driver. Very cool. Thank you. Absolutely. Let's see. Um, next, uh, Mike says, what a marriage, you can do some cool stuff with the still shots too. Absolutely. You can do 3D modeling. Um, and you, you can do all kinds of uh, really cool stuff that honestly we can, we can spend all day talking about. <laughs> um, looking for grants for equipment. Uh, yeah, uh, so Tony, as far as grants go, there, there are lots of grants out there depending on what you're trying to do. Um, uh, unfortunately, in that space, there's also a lot of noise or, or grants that are specific to specific things. Um, so you, you, you may have to dig down and kind of sift through that a little bit. Uh, to, to be able to, to find one for you. I know the most common ones for starting drone programs that I've seen has been Perkins funding. And, and I don't know, you know how much or how well your school utilizes that, um, but that's, that's been a good one. Um, yes. NSF funding, absolutely, National Science Foundation funding, um, getting a project through NSF. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure on the, on the elementary or K through 12 side how that works. If you have um, a side for that, I'm just not too yeah, all of our stuff has been in the, the ATE side, the Advanced Technician Education. Um, so I I'm, I'm, don't have a specific answer for you on that. But uh, like I said, the, the first place I start is Perkins Funding. And uh, depending on where you are, I know Perkins coordinators are very excited about drones and the way they can integrate them into the classroom. I know here in Minnesota, at least, I, I talked to the uh, statewide Perkins coordinator. And a uh, great person, super excited. Um, you know, we, we talked for quite a while on, on drones and, and things we can and can't do. So, um, they, like I said, there's, that, that's going to take a little digging on, on the grant side there. If you can tie it into something else uh, or another organization, that'd be great. Uh, I, I really look at the, uh, the businesses around you, especially if you have tech-based businesses, uh, to, to see about getting them involved and getting some sponsorship. I think that might be the well, I won't necessarily say the easiest because it's likely to be a lot of legwork. Uh, but as far as the, the restrictions and things that come with grants, uh, can sometimes be limiting on how you can spend that money. Uh, whether whereas the sponsorship, uh, you know, you tell me you want to start a drone program, and you know, here's the money for your drone program, however you see fit. Uh, so there, there are you know different different aspects to keep in mind there. One thing to uh, note on the Perkins funding, and this is something new for this upcoming uh, fiscal year. Uh, is that uh, Perkins funding is, is now going to be tied to outcomes-based uh, assessments uh, to include credentialing of students that are in Perkins funded programs. So for, for instance, uh, if you want to use some Perkins funding for uh, completing or creating a drone program, uh, then you had better have the part 107 uh, licensing process as part of that drone program so that you can show uh, show um, uh, progress and show certifications coming out of that Perkins funding because if you don't include uh, those credentials of value going forward that Perkins funding will dry up very quickly uh, because uh, the government is looking for outcomes based uh, measures of the utilization of those funds. No that's great advice Terry uh, absolutely and, and frankly if you're working with kids in the uh, 16 plus age range, 15 plus age range. I would absolutely one of the first things I do is is a, a 107, uh, you know, practical course. Uh, I mean, at, at the end of the day, even if they never use it, whatever, um, you, you're giving them a third party certification that can set them apart from their peers, um, and, and there's there's no downside to that in my book. So, all right, next we got uh, James going to be doing a 107 certification as part of class. Uh, looking at students work their way through a couple of drones during the class and any recommendations for the drones. Um, so the, the first thing that I'd say is that's an absolute great idea, uh, working through them. And, and what I really say is that uh, actually a little bit backwards uh, from what uh, from what you got listed there. Um, so what, what I do personally, DJI with their flight modes, with their stability, uh, and, and frankly, reliability. Uh, I, I really start with the DJI. If you look at the, the Mavic Airs, the, the Mavic Minis, things like that, um, the, the, it's a relatively quality aircraft that, that can be used multiple different ways, um, but still allows you that, that safety net 
Um, because with the DJI drones, if I get into trouble, all I gotta do is let go of the sticks and the aircraft just covers. Um, that's all well and good, that's great starter stuff. Um, so maybe, maybe start in the middle, go down to an aircraft that then does not have that GPS and, and that, those extra stability features that actually require a pilot to be able to hand fly it and then move up to maybe a more expensive sense of like, you know, a, a, a Matrice or, or a, an Inspire, you know, whatever, you're, whatever way you decide to go there. Um, so, so I'd really start in that middle that you had identified there as a, as a, as a Mavic Air and, and go down from there to less features, more active flying, and then up to maybe a proper commercial system at that point. I'm sure there's other people out there who will argue with me, but that's my thought. Um, doo -doo -doo. So that's for the drones. For improving their skills, use that NIST, uh, that NIST guide. Uh, again, that's going to be in the in the packet that we send out. Um, it's it's amazingly cool and can be adapted to so many levels, and it is out there and used in the industry. So again, no downsides to get them started on NIST. They they give you full specs on building and everything out of. As Tom said, wood in three and five gallon buckets. I think they said about two hundred dollars worth of materials if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so I mean, and a little bit of time investment, obviously, but that's that's certainly the way that I go uh, when, when looking at that. Um, tools, spare parts, etc. Uh, you, you're going to want to wear to, to have spare props, uh, spare landing gear, depending on what you're doing. Uh, tools are going to be more specific to that UAS. Uh, DJI really loves long handled torques uh, for their stuff or long handled allen wrenches. Uh, you can't get the normal stuff down in there long enough. Um, so, so that's really going to depend on, on your system itself uh, as far as the spares go. Um, Mike, for the parrot bluegrass, I have heard it. I've heard plenty of people use it. I have not used it myself. Um, I've heard some, it earlier. Yeah, I've heard some good things about it. Um, my hesitation on my end for using it is A, I've already got multi-spectral capable uh, aircraft there, and, and B, uh, pair it on their commercial size, on their commercial stuff, hasn't done the best in the past. Don't know where they're at now with it because I haven't used it myself, so I can't say. Um, but I have heard people say that it is, uh, that it is well used, and uh, some people like it, some people hate it. Sorry, I can't give you much more recommendation than that. Uh, let's see. Um, how to base their AI uh, for, for the drones. Um, I like a mixture of both. I like to be able to do both within my classes. Um, I want students to be able to hand fly. I want to be able to switch out of sport mode uh, or into sport mode where we turn sensors off and on uh, to, to you know collision sensors and things like that. I like the ability to uh, include coding into it. Uh, and, and you know the, the AI type stuff that can be added to it. Uh, so the more we can find a, an aircraft that is a, a mix of all of them, or, or the ability to use all of them, uh, that's absolutely where I'd point. Especially if you're looking, uh, if you're looking K twelve. All right. Are minis programmable with drone blocks? I don't know on that one. I don't believe so. I, I think the Mavic Mini was really just a. Uh, I won't say a gimmick, uh, but but another option from like the Matic Air, uh, the the next option for the Matic Air, or Matic Air Two, uh, that that type of area. Um, I, I know a lot of folks really like the small handheld in your pocket, literally in your pocket type drone uh, that you can pull out, flip open the the, the landing gear, and and away you go. Um, there's there's definitely some value to that uh, that small form factor, easy to use. I own a Matic Pro myself. It goes everywhere with me. I mean, I, I can probably count on one hand the number of times I've not had that aircraft at, at least in my truck or something or, or somewhere near uh, over the last two years, um, and, and I constantly take it out. So, um, so like I said, there's something to say for that, uh, but I, I look more than just a single use case. You know, if, if my big thing is that hey, it's portable not necessarily what the camera is, the flight time, and all the other things involved with it. Um, you know, I, I go with that full picture versus the, uh, versus just one or two different things, so. Uh, Sparkers DJ Mini, Sparkers Grandma with Drone Blocks, was wondering the difference. Um, off 
top of my head, I can't say the difference between a spark and a mini. Uh, but it's kind of outside of the class that I tend to deal with on a daily, weekly, monthly, or yearly basis. Um, I, I just don't do anything with them. If I'm if I'm going with the small stuff, I'm, I'm looking at the the mambos and the tellos and, and you know the abilities there. Um, if I go anything past that, uh, my my entry level you know is is the Matic Pro and then you know inspires up from there. So I I don't have a a direct Spark versus Mini comparison for you. Although I'm betting if you spend a little time online, there are people whose entire job seems to be making videos that compare one drone to another. Um, and that may be the way to go, just uh, looking through YouTube there. Right. How else can we help you? What other questions can we answer for you? We still got a good 24 minutes to fill, and apparently I love to talk. Where are the babies from? Yeah, no, I'm not answering that. <laughs> it looks like you got about 12 or 13 still on here, and uh, I'll happily chat with you. I feel like I'm on a telephone now. Come on, give us a call, send us some money, and no. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, I'll give it another couple minutes in case somebody's typing a long question. Uh, if you are typing a long question, go ahead and stop typing, unmute your microphone, yeah. and let's chat. Yeah. Hey guys, got a question. Hey, good. Where's the survey? The survey should be coming out. Uh, Chelsea Blado will be sending it out to everybody. It should come from the Drone Tech email okay. account. Touch uh, base real quick. Tom's gonna gonna run out there and uh, and get her to get that survey out uh, as soon as possible. Here, I, I'm sure she's no, waiting for her okay to send it out. So that's fine. I just uh, hadn't quite uh, connected. I was losing my internet connection when you were talking about that, and I was thinking, oops, I'm not quite sure where it is. So I was just kind of checking my emails. So good. I'll look for it. All right, great. So like I said, it should come from the NCTC Drone Tech email. Uh, if not, it'll come from Chelsea Blado herself. Um, so just keep an eye on it. I, I will make sure that we get it out. We, we, it's already developed and ready to go out. So uh, we, we should be able to get that out here before our close of business today. And uh, hopefully get it back to you as soon as possible. <laughs> will do. Thank you much for the great show. Well, thank you very much, and I, I really appreciate this group's enthusiasm for the survey. It's not like I haven't mentioned it so many times, um, but I'm actually getting questions from multiple people asking where the survey is, so that, that makes me feel good, like we're going to get a good return rate on this. Good show. <laughs> All right, uh, Julie, can we talk a bit about our STEM trailer, and do we have solar electric for charging, plan of holding classes in parks, nature preserves, etc. Okay, um, so our STEM trailer, the one we're talking about for drones, is still in the conceptual phase. Uh, we're, we're working on, uh, on if we're going to have final authorization to put it together and how we're going to do it. Uh, but basically it would run much like the TransCOE's uh, trailer. Uh, there's a welding trailer, there's a VEX trailer uh, that I know come from, from this organization here. Um, so basically the idea is, is we'd stock it up with everything you need for a, a drone class. Um, everything from part 107 materials to, uh, to, to aircraft sensors, maybe a, a rad competition field. We, ha we haven't quite got all the, the pieces in place. Um, and then of course, we've always got to sell it to higher ups um, because as much as I love going out and do projects, somebody always controls the first string somewhere. And then we gotta make sure that we check all the boxes for that. Uh, but the idea is, is that we'd be able to uh, basically do a timeshare type thing. Uh, in that if, if, for instance, you, uh, Julie, if I remember correctly, you were over by Stillwater Schools. And uh, so in, in that case, you'd say, well, for, for this period of time, you know, the, whatever, March, March 1st through 8th, you know, we're going to be doing drone related stuff. And, uh, you know, we'd really love to, to borrow the trailer. And maybe up until that time, you're, you're running a class that's all about Part 107 and the things they need there, give them a chance to get certified. And then we'd bring out the trailer for you. You'd be able to use it for that week. Um, we'd have a 
training. This is, this is the way it's working in my head, just as, as a reminder, we haven't done all the pools yet. Um, but the way it worked in my head is that we actually have a, a coach's training or, or a training for the folks who want to use the trailer. Uh, we produce uh, you know, videos and resources and documentation uh, to go along with that. Uh, but we, we have the on site where we come out into regional areas and we would hold trainings for those who may be interested in using the trailer. We'd train you up on all the equipment inside there. Once you're trained up and checked off, you just let us know what works, works for you uh, as far as you know what week you wanted or whatever. And, and then be able to uh, to basically check it out during that time with, and we're not sure you know how the moving would work. Um, you know, would, would you be responsible for pushing it on to the next uh, the next local district or something or local school or something like that, or would we drive from down here? You know, there's there's a lot of logistics and things that's got to be worked out for it. Uh, but that's just the the idea that's you know got the little hamster in the back of my head running circles. Chelsea hasn't gone home, but she plans on uh, sending that survey to the person tomorrow. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, as far as where we hold classes, um, frankly, anywhere, in my opinion. I mean, you know, we, we like to go out and there's, there's always some kind of classroom portion. Uh, but frankly, I, for me at least as an educator, I am more than happy to walk away from a PowerPoint presentation at any time and just sit and have a conversation out in the field. Um, and that has the, the added bonus of then we can turn around and fly right in that field. Um, so we, we're not sure, I mean, if, if we were to hold, say, the coaches that training uh, for, for the trailer type idea, um, you know, likely there, there'd be a, a local community college, something like that within like the Men's State Institution or within, uh, you know, the, the, the region that we'd be holding the camp uh, that, that we do it at there. Um, when it comes to bringing students out, um, that's going to be a mixture of both uh, the the in person kind of kind of in seating classes. You know when we start talking regulations and things like that, uh, that may have benefits. You know being able to take notes, all that fun stuff. Uh, when we're working towards a, a certification, uh, having computer access that has internet access. Again, there's there's some value there. Uh, but of course, you're going to want to be somewhere that you can then turn around and fly, whether it's indoors in indoor space or an outdoor space. So. Excuse me. Uh, hopefully that answered some of your questions. And uh, again, we can we can definitely answer some more. So um, let's see next. Have we tried to work with the Red Cross uh, together with drones? I specifically have not. Um, I frankly don't even know where the nearest Red Cross place would be for us um, or anybody in the organization there. Um, I'm in Grand Forks for us here, and I was one of the others. Okay. So, so yeah, no, no, Doug, I've not uh, worked with the Red Cross at all there. Uh, cost of us having to come out and work with a group of students uh, looking to build these opportunities. Um, so for the most part, as long as we can fit it into our framework that we've got for NCAT, there's, there's not going to be any cost for you guys for us to do that. Uh, right now, we are National Science Foundation funded, and, as, and like I said, as long as we, we work within that framework and, and the objectives that we have, and going out and training up people on, on Drones and ways to integrate into their classroom and get students more interested. Uh, you know, we're looking, we, we're looking at, and we've done, you know, Boy Scout events. Uh, we work with Civil Air Patrol. Uh, you know, uh, all kinds of different things uh, in order to, to pull in more students and, and run some of these camps. Uh, we run summer camps. That this year has been the one exception, uh, but we run a summer camp here uh, every year for students. Uh, again, except for this year, uh, that we pull them in for for free or minimal cost. I mean, maybe they pay 20 bucks or something like that. I believe it was 20 or 25, maybe. Uh, uh, going on the road and pretty adaptable to time frames. And... Yep, absolutely. And and if we can if we can pull in, you know, multiple people that could wind up being these these coaches, these mentors, uh, and that just checks more boxes for us. You know, so if we can if we hold an event down there at, at your local high school and you can bring in you know other educators from the area, you can bring in you know community mentors from from the, the Boys and Girls Club, from the Boy Scouts, you know, whatever it is, uh, we, we can definitely work with you to, to get something going on and, and in a way that minimizes prices. With our educator workshop that we hold up here every year, not only have we had no charge for the teachers, um, but we've actually been able to pay for them to come up here. Uh, we've been able to cover you know housing fees, food, all kinds of stuff. So we're, we're really looking to minimize any uh, any financial cost for, for you folks 
Um, and as long as, again, we can work within that framework of our objectives for our grants. And I love the idea of the upside of the ambulance. In fact, uh, me and these, these gentlemen here have, uh, have been chatting about that for some time now. Uh, we, we haven't you know, quite found the grant funds that, that covers a, a vehicle and- I'm a pontoon guy. You know. Know. Yes, yes, so, so we've got a local river here and Tom wants a, a pontoon to use as a launch pad so he can cruise up and down the river and, and monitor you know, farms and ditches and stuff like that. Um, and, and Mr. Steve has been a, a big fan of the ambulance uh, of remodeling it and, and turning it into one of those. So uh, I, I definitely found some, some good deals around, uh, but again, there'd be funding for, for having to, to get that up to speed and, and into usable condition and reliable condition, uh, because it's not something that would just sit here on our site. We definitely want to move it around. And then of course, if we get the ambulance, we can make sure that it's got a hitch so we can pull the bunch of Yep. So, <laughs> uh, uh, airline and sea, baby. <laughs> So, um, but no, it's definitely a great idea if you can find the funding and, and maybe like a local auto program uh, at a local high school that's willing to kind of pull it apart to make sure it's all in good working condition. I mean, you could really, uh, you could really tie in a lot of programs to that. Uh, so that there'd be a way to maybe share funding and, and things like that uh, among the cohort that you out there, so. Thank you. Yeah. I found one that is good to go. It, it used to be a, um, an ice fishing house that somebody had had, um, um, had had poured all this money into and built. And, and then um, the axle is a little rusty, but everything else, the electrical, everything's perfect. Everything else is pristine. And he only wants $2,000 for it. So I'm ready to go and you know pay for it myself and throw a solar panel on top. So. Um, I was just wondering what you thought of that. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. I mean, and in fact, if you're going to be doing stuff like throwing solar panels on top and, and batteries inside for an uninterruptible power supply, um, you know, mounting screens, all that stuff, again, I'm betting you can find local programs there in the, in the, the region uh, that they'd be very interested in having their students participate in it. Um, so again, might, might, you know, drive down costs and help speed things along. I know there's nothing worse than a project that sits because you don't have the time to work on it. Um, and then, of course, having a, you know, a drone service vehicle that has flashy lights. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of lights and sirens. And my, my uh, Fab Lab kids can make a vinyl wrap for it, too, so we can redesign and put, like, sponsoring on, on the side that could change all the time. And I think nice. I know, I know, like, there's a Roseville High School down there as a a huge like printing where they do I, I think vinyl and all kinds of other printing and um, so again I mean any, we found that anytime we can collaborate with other existing programs out there obviously we can stretch our dollar much much farther. Okay um, so which schools are you collaborating with because I would like to try to partner with them so we can talk about doing maybe a, a co-op sharing of resources in, in the metro area because I'm not f finding that everything is so siloed and all these schools are competing against each other. And we need to change that type of mindset so our kids can have more opportunity. Absolutely. So I can tell you that we work with uh, the Anoka uh, Pathways or Steps to Step program there. Um, let's see there. I, I can give you a, a specific guy in the email here. I'm not going to throw his name out with everybody here. I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, but I'm sure he'd love to collaborate with you. Um, so I can, I can kind of get you set up with him. Um, we even had college and high school going. He was teaching a part 107 type class at the time. And so we were able to get, so his students who went through and got their 107 automatically got credit here at Northland uh, for that class. And I happily do that with, with anybody else who's interested. Um, you know, any, anytime we can bring college credits down to the high school level, we, we love to do that type of stuff. Um, and then Rose, the, do we have our, our Pathways coordinator contact you guys? Because he's trying to build this program. And if we can build in certifications for our kids and get a, a, a pipeline to, a, you know, two-year programs, you know. Absolutely. Okay, great. You can spread my, uh, my email address far and wide, man. Okay. Uh, so uh, people pay me to answer emails and to talk to people. So, I mean, I can't complain too much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, what's the guy that uh, 
Roseville was the other one uh, where we've been working with. And again, I'm not just going to throw his name out there, but if she's interested, I, I can definitely get her in contact with him. Um, me, me and Julie have some quality emails that need to happen. Um, so I, I look forward to, to seeing one from you here soon. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for this. This was awesome. It was the best no professional development I've been part of in 20 years. <laughs> So. Well, that is great to hear and, and a huge compliment. Thank you very much. We, we do our best. Please, uh, again, with the survey, don't lie to us. Don't, you're not going to hurt our feelings. Any way we can make ourselves better, we look forward to doing it. Hey, guys, can you still hear me? Yes, sir. Hey, what campus are you located on? We're on the aerospace campus. So uh, it's, it's not a campus alone. We're at the aerospace site. Uh, but we're five miles down the road from the Thief River Falls main campus, and we're actually located on the Thief River Falls airport. Okay, so that's uh, three, I'm sorry, Thief Rivers Falls? Yes, sir. Thief River Falls, as in uh, Thief, one who steals? It's one of the campuses that's on the list for your school. Is uh, East yeah, Grand yeah. Forks, the Thief Rivers, uh, and the Northland Aerospace, which is in Thief, Thief, Thief Rivers Falls. Yes, sir. That's us. The aerospace site is us. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, thanks a lot, James. We appreciate that. James says he agrees with, I'm, I'm assuming he's agreeing with, with Julie with how awesome we were. So, um, <laughs> all right, well, anything else you guys want to discuss? Anything else you want to talk about? Random comments? Pretty well getting crickets at this point, so uh, I, I think we'll I think we'll close it up at this point. Um, but but I will say again, you've got our contact information. Please reach out. Any questions, concerns, help with anything, uh, we, we love to do it. This is this is what we enjoy doing. Um, I can talk drones all day long. Uh, we can actually get to a point where you guys will tell me to be quiet. So uh, I'm going to do that myself at this point. Uh, please reach out to, to any one of us, uh, Steve Sorensen, Tom Miller, or myself, Zach Nicklin. And we'll happily uh, talk drones and your programs and the different things that we can do, the geospatial side, uh, avionics and electronics. Uh, we're, we're pretty well versed in, in a lot of different things here. Um, and if we don't have an answer, we can certainly either find it or, or find you a, a contact that does have that information. So thank you very much for your time today. Yes, ma'am? A, lot, um, a last question for you guys. Um, so you had mentioned contacting the Department of the Interior. Who would you contact? The, like uh, the, the fleet manager? Or would you go higher than that? I just want to find out with this inventory because I've, I've heard from several people now who have worked with the government that these are grounded permanently. Yeah, that's a good question. And for the rest of you that are out here that maybe didn't follow in the chat, uh, the Department of Interior has grounded all DJI aircraft or aircraft with Chinese components, which is dang near every aircraft out there. Um, so they get this huge fleet that's just sitting there and uh, where they, there is an inventory online. As far as the specific person to contact, I'm not positive, but I can tell you how I'm gonna spend the rest of my week. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if they're permanently down and just sitting there, I can think of so much better uses for it. Okay. And frankly, it might help me with my, uh, with, with selling to my higher ups that trailer idea, if I can populate it at a fraction of the cost of new. Perfect. Keep me posted. <laughs> I'm going to yeah, try that. <laughs> I'm going to try uh, that. Um, I'll share if I find out. So. Yes, please do. Please do. A comment along that same line. I'm hearing that the Department of Defense has also got some heartburn over the unique drones. Yes, so unique are our Chinese made as well. Um, and in fact, they're, they're looking at multiple. So even like the Parrots, Parrot, even though it's a French company, a lot of the interior parts are actually Chinese made. Uh, it's very, very hard to find a flight controller out there that's being used commercially that is not Chinese made. 
There are some few exceptions. Uh, Pixhawk Cube, I believe, is American name, and, and there's a couple other ones, but but those are not prolific in the commercial world. Uh, those are more used along the, the builders, the modelers, uh, the, the specific, you know, I, I build only, you know, heavy lift airframes. Um, there is like Procerus from, uh, at least Procerus, uh, Lockheed Martins, uh, and then there's like Cloudcat Technology, but boy, Cloudcat Technology, they, they've been selling to the military for so long that their pricing structure is a little bit insane in my book, at least for consumer grade or, or even, even smaller commercial grade items. Uh, because they, they've been used to being able to, uh, to make that money off the Department of Defense uh, that, that the rest of us just don't have to spend. Um, so it, it is difficult, and, but they, they are out there, but they're just, they're not coming. So with these folks grounding their aircraft, and unless something changes, uh, there may be a, a glut of aircraft coming to the market, um, depending. I mean, I can certainly see, you know, DOD or something like that destroying you know, <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure about the DOI, but um, so there's, you know, ho hopefully they, uh, you know, they, they do a nice yard sale uh, on a whole bunch of drones, and uh, I can tell you that I'll, I'll be the first in line to, to pick over what I can. Great. Well, thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks, Luke. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So this time we are going to go ahead and then wrap up here. Um, thank you all for attending. We really enjoyed it. Uh, we enjoyed talking drones. Again, please reach out to us uh, for, for any follow-up, any information, any, hey, I thought this was cool. Let me send it to Zach. I'm good with that. All right. Um, so, so please don't, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we would love to help you in any way we can. All right. As far as that goes, um, everybody have a great day. Thank you very much for attending.